In formulating a Superman, he is, on account of certain superior qualities inherent in him, exempted from the ordinary laws which govern ordinary men. He is not liable for anything he may do, whereas others would be, except for the crime that is, it is possible for him to commit, to make a mistake. I'm Shuey, and this is Strangeful Things. Unsolved, unresolved, and super complicated. Strange things. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome, everyone, to another Shuey Rific episode of Strangeful Things. I'm Shuey, and I'm here with Acadia and the lovely Mel's. <laughs> How are y'all doing? Well, this week, uh, Mrs. Ack is on vacation. Ooh. Ooh. And. So far, it's rained the first two days, but she didn't even care because she read her Kindle book for an entire day while it just thundered out. So nice. You can't get much better than that. That sounds uh, so nice. That's awesome. None of that had anything to do with me, but I'm happy for her. <laughs> that is so sweet. <laughs> yeah, that was pretty good. Well, the good then, news well, is I'm still here, but I don't have anything new because it's COVID. <laughs> yeah. There's nothing new going on. <laughs> nothing. <laughs> well, no, we made a video. Oh, yeah, that's yeah. True. That, not that kind. We made one about the stand. That's right. <laughs> you guys yeah. are perverts. As, yeah, uh, I don't know. Somebody <laughs> posted something about that. Let's make sure we clear it up. <laughs> yeah. You can go to, the, and this was on the Superficial Gallery uh, YouTube channel, not the uh, the Strangeful one. Although we could do videos for Strangeful. Yeah. We could do a Terrare video. No way. Well, no, we could Count never do that. <laughs> Count me we out. We could never, ever, where ever we, do that. Where we act it out. Oh. No. The <laughs> cat. <laughs> Who Save wants the cats. The half a lion or whatever that is? Oh, <laughs> Quarter of a rhinoceros and a uh, some oh. snakes. <laughs> some snakes. <laughs> yeah, oh, man. That was a special one. We hope yeah. you really liked that last week. So now yeah, that was, we're gonna. That was uh, something. Shuey brought us in a completely different direction. Yes. So, uh, like I said, this is going to be a shoeyrific episode, but what I neglected to say that it's actually only a part one of a two-parter. My nice. new and good for this week was that I actually completed a script, but I only completed a script because I made one that was way too long, so I actually <laughs> completed it by completing half of one, so... How about but that math? For this, it is good math. <laughs> yeah, that's some for quick this math very special episode, we're going to discuss a couple of rich dicks from the early 20th century. They were famous at the time and known as Leopold and Loeb. So why would we talk about these rich dicks in particular? Well, for a few reasons in my mind. One, as demonstrated by the quote from the cold open, which comes from a letter that Leopold wrote to Loeb, the actions of these men are pretty fascinating because not only did they, it's not because they killed somebody, but it's because of why they did it and what they expected the implications of doing that to be. All right. And that's what's really interesting about this case. Um, they also committed a crime that um, resulted in one of the first trials of the century for the 20th century. Technically, it was known as the third one. There was another rich guy that killed somebody, and then there were um, Ferdinand Sacco and Bartolomo Vanzetti, who those were the two Italian immigrants uh, who happened to be anarchists and got tried and then fried for uh, armed robbery and murder. But uh, well, that's excellent. Yeah. <laughs> Do you guys though, Mel's and Acadia? Do you guys have a favorite? 
trial of the century from the 20th century because there were probably like a hundred of them. It was probably yeah. almost one every year. Hmm. Mine is probably O.J. Simpson. Yeah, yeah, I figured that would be a big one. Yeah. Yeah, because it, just looking back at it now and seeing how, you know, everybody was like, DNA, you're crazy. People don't have <laughs> letters People inside have them. Like, <laughs> <laughs> none of that was, like, accepted and everything like that. Yeah, it's just so like, what just, if it was one in every 4.7 billion it could happen and yeah. there's only 5 billion on the planet at the time? <laughs> exactly. You're just yelling, object at the screen. Uh, I don't know. I think... It, if you're going to have, obviously, since the 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 biggest crime of the century in a in a real sense was the Holocaust, then you'd have to say the Nuremberg trials were the trial of the century. Mm. Yeah, I guess that was probably and the I, one that had like the biggest impact on the whole world. Yeah, the whole world was watching it. Whereas and all I these also, other ones, it's mostly a lot of them are are because the person's famous that is alleged the murderer like fatty arbuckle or 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 um oj like stuff like that uh but patty hurst the mm. menendez brothers weren't famous I until was, they i was just about to say them but they were rich and which puts them in the same category as leopold and Loeb. and then i was also saying the other uh rich dick was a uh, harry kendall thaw who killed a guy over a woman? Like so, they all so it's either like a a rich guy, because then it then it then it turns into like what the fuck is with society, or it's a famous person because then you know everybody wants to see. Uh, well, I think it's that everybody wants to see somebody high up fall. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So whether they're rich or they're famous, as long as we can see them fall, it makes us happy. <laughs> That's right. That's right. fine with me. We're looking at you, Bezos. That's right. Oh, don't get me started. The other reason I wanted to do this story is because the victim is not a freaking woman whose life was incredibly shitty before she either disappeared or murdered. Like, I know we had Flight 800 and Tarar. Oh. <laughs> Tarar. Oh. Oh. Sing it, Mills. Terrare. <laughs> there you go. But I started on this before those episodes were on. So before those two aired, we've been on quite a streak of uh, what I thought were wonderfully executed and wonderfully written, but terrible stories between the Jennings Eight or Judith Himes or Emma Philippoff, and I just couldn't deal. So. Um, not that this is a happy story, because if it were, you know, Acadia wouldn't let me even do it. <laughs> fucking right I wouldn't. You got to stay on brand. And our brand is not happy stories. Like I've said many times to the <laughs> delight of nobody, we're not the happy fun time show. I mean, we'll, throw, we'll throw a Fresno Nightcrawler in as a little palate cleanser once in a while. <laughs> but that's about it. And and historical accuracy with our Aztecs. There you go. Because technically, technically, the Aztecs wasn't true crime because to them it wasn't a crime. It wasn't like the Aztec cops were tracking down the priests that were chopping everybody up. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Now, before we get to the actual story like to get some background on these two assholes. So, Mel's. It was a cold and windy November morning. The fuck do you know that? Because I do very thorough research, you ass. So back <laughs> off. Who started right. this? Snoopy? All right, go Calm ahead. Calm down. <laughs> Mel's, please continue. <laughs> okay, well, as I was trying to say... On a cold, windy November morning in Chicago, and this is not the beginning of In the Ghetto by Elvis Presley. <laughs> uh, in 1904, Nathan Frodenthal, a quote unquote babe, Leopold was born. Now, his parents were Florence and Nathan Leopold Sr., a wealthy immigrant couple. 
His father inherited a shipping company and expanded his fortune by getting into aluminum cans and paper boxes. It is believed that the family was worth about $4 million. Now, that's $52 million in today's money. So they were definitely Ugh. one percenters, all right? <laughs> nice. Yeah. Good for Babe, them. Yeah, good, yeah, good on them. <laughs> Babe grew up in the super ritzy Kenwood section of Chicago South Side. His family's mansion was only a couple of blocks away from the Loeb estate. Now, being a super rich kid, his parents had very little to do with him, of course. <laughs> he, was, he was raised by a nanny, and she made sure to leave her mark on the kid, as we'll find out later in the trial, which is sad. Uh, Babe immediately started showing that he was not just a regular kid. The story is that he spoke his first words at four months old, which I find very hard to believe. <laughs> Wildcat at four months old was just drooling, yeah. but he eventually <laughs> became fluent in five languages. Shit, I can barely handle one. Well, I've noticed that, Shuey. So oh, now, thank you. <clears throat> would you mind letting me get through this paragraph, please? <laughs> <laughs> All right, so he eventually became fluent in five languages, although being the cocky son of a bitch he was, he told people that he knew 13 languages, because why not? <laughs> well, um, five immediately becomes 10 if you count all caps and you just yell the language. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll take that. I'll take that. And then if you whisper it, it's italics, so that's technically 15. So really, he could have gone a little higher. <laughs> and that is science everybody in case you That's were wondering right. That's some so. good science. now while he was still in his teens he was considered a global expert in ornithology having had multiple papers published in the alt the foremost ornithology journal in the united states at the time now unfortunately for babe he did not get along with people like he did his birds <laughs> if you can imagine <laughs> in his defense for not having friends, not for the killing part, but in his defense, if you had an IQ of over, let's say 200 like babe, then you may have trouble holding a conversation with regular folk. I mean, shit, that's a high IQ. Yep. Wow. Yeah, that's fucking nuts. So babe was of course not liked by many people because well, basically he was the know-it-all. And he was the guy at the party who had to show everyone how much he knew and how much more he knew than they did. And why was the bird magazine called the Ark? <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, I missed out a good opportunity on a joke there. <laughs> you were too busy worrying about having to say ornithology. I was. Ornithology multiple times, yeah. And I think I pronounced it wrong anyway so who cares <laughs> oh, it was close enough okay. yeah it's fine everybody knows what we mean everybody knows what you were talking about <laughs> now richard lb albert dicky Loeb. that's right oh, dicky dicky <laughs> trouble <laughs> dicky don't look for trouble trouble finds dicky anyway <laughs> <laughs> he was born on a warm June evening in 1905 to the parents, Anna Henrietta and Albert Henry Loeb. Albert was a wealthy lawyer and retired vice president of Sears Roebuck and Company. Good for him. The he Loeb family. Catalogs. Yeah, right. Ooh. Well, how would we know about those underwear and those long shirts? Remember? Yeah, that's <laughs> right. The Sears catalog has it been all, very good to this show. It very all good ties in. Yeah. The Loeb family was said to be worth around $10 million or $130 million today. Whew. Wow. And like Mel said, the Loeb family lived just a couple of blocks from the Leopolds. Interesting, interesting fact. Barack Obama's house is like right in that neighborhood. Oh, really? Like huh. blocks from them, yeah. Interesting. Almost a complete opposite to Babe, Dickie wanted to have fun. He loved reading, especially crime novels and pulp comic books. Unfortunately for Dickie, he was also being raised by nannies. His nanny was unrelenting when it came to pushing Dickie in his studies. He's, she was pushing Dickie all the time. <laughs> he, was, he was never allowed to go out and have fun, always studying. What he did have going for him is that he was very charismatic. 
A professor at Northwestern University knew them both and had commented that Dickie was the most charming, intelligent student he had ever taught. My stars. I guess maybe the bar is lower for intelligent students. I don't, <laughs> yeah, I don't know why he said the most charming, intelligent student. Right? Because <laughs> there are charming, dumb ones, too. So. <laughs> Even though they lived in the same neighborhood and likely knew of each other, they did not meet and become friends until 1920 when they were both matriculating Mm. all over the place at the University of Chicago, which is where Indiana Jones taught. That is true. As soon as they met, they became close friends. There was a dynamic between them that just worked. Babe immediately fell in love with Dickie. Oh. They kind of had like a master, which was the Dickie Loeb, and a slave, which was a baby Leopold kind of thing going on. And even though Babe was super intelligent and believed himself to be better than pretty much everyone else, he was not a leader. He liked being told what to do. Both boys were also into the teachings of Friedrich Nietzsche especially with the concept of the Ubermensch or Superman. And we're not talking about the dude in his undies from Krypton. Mm-hmm. The idea is that, huh? I was just sad that we're not. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Can we? <laughs> the idea is that there are people, Superman, or I guess it could be women, although this was written in the 19th century, so probably not women, but the idea is that these Superman who because of their superiority to ordinary people, like you all, are not governed Fucker. by the same ordinary laws as us. I mean, the the supermen. <laughs> you, they are above the law. And this would prove to be a major piece of the motive puzzle. Well, it's actually kind of true. Yeah, well... Like... <laughs> it's... Well, it it depends on how you measure it, I guess. I guess it's more measured by dollars in this country. Well, yeah, that's (laughs) – but (laughs) everybody immediately thinks that that if you're rich, you must have been smart enough to get rich. Right. Right. Not that your your father owned a whatever, owned a a shipping company or – Right. Even if you go – even if you prove to the person that – the person you're talking about really didn't do anything to earn any of that money. Oh, well, he was right. smart enough to not lose it. It's literally impossible to spend that much money unless you buy, like, war companies. <laughs> yeah, or sports teams or something. Yeah. Ugh. Yeah. All right, so thanks for bringing it down to reality. Um, much <laughs> of their time together at the University of Chicago was spent indulging Dickey. Dickie had a thing for vandalism, stealing cars, and arson. He also enjoyed drinking, playing cards, and picking up women. These are all things Babe could not care less about. But being the good bitch that he was, he partook in everything Dickie asked. The boys did get split up for a time when Dickie transferred to the University of Michigan. Now, can I just say that this it sounds a lot like the Poncho and Lefty song to me. <laughs> They're like the Poncho and Lefty. <laughs> All right. Now, the boys' experience at college were very different. Babe was an exemplary student, always focused on his studies. He graduated at the age of 19 with Phi Beta Kappa honors, which is like a 3.7 out of 4 GPA. So, did anybody here graduate Phi Beta Kappa? Katia? Chewy? Not me. Nah. Well, Did you, Chewy? No way. I was like a 2.7. You know who did, though? Probably Paul. No, Sullivan. Ah! Remember. Ah! Sullivan. Anyways. Well, I didn't think it was going to be you too. So, I, <laughs> I mean, I guess I mean feign being shocked by that, but I'm not. <laughs> so, anyhow, Dickie's time was much different. Dickie liked to party. 
He transferred yeah. to, to the University of Michigan because he was doing really poorly at the University of Chicago. He did start college at 14, so I can understand these challenges, not personally, but I get it. <laughs> so, mm-hmm. When he got to Michigan, he joined a fraternity and continued to drink and womanize. While Dickie was gone, Babe was heartbroken. Oh, Aww. Dickie was too busy having fun to keep in touch with his old friend. And even though Dickie was super smart, his grades never improved. They were good enough, though, for Dickie to become the youngest graduate in the history of the University of Michigan at the age of 17. So as far as I can tell, nobody's beaten him yet. Jesus. Yeah. yeah. But he, <laughs> So basically, he ran around when he was 16, drinking and having his regular college experience. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. When he was a literal, like, he, what do you have, his first pew party? Exactly. (laughs) Freshman year was really big for growing out his pubis. Everybody, Dickie got a pub. Let's party. Oh, oh my God. Meanwhile, Babe is just surrounded in books. And birds. And And birds. birds. Soft birds. I'll leave Babe alone. Uh, So... In 1923, having both received their bachelor's degrees, they met up again at the University of Chicago where they were both continuing their studies. You know, for a couple of cold-hearted murderers, these guys were big (laughs) fucking nerds. Dickie wanted to continue his crime spree, breaking windows and crap like that, and he wanted Babe with him doing it. So the boys deepened their relationship with a deal. The deal was that Babe would commit crimes with Dickie in exchange for Dickie letting Babe indulge in him sexually. So, I'm going to break this down for you. Basically, Dickie wanted somebody to go around with him and bust windows so bad that he just said, yeah, you can have my ass, whatever. Exactly. <laughs> I enjoy having someone with me vandalizing yeah. and setting things on fire. That, yeah, I'm going to put somebody's balls in my mouth. I need a Robin so bad. I need a Robin so bad that, and was, did, now did you find out, was was Dickie actually gay or was he just basically gay for pay and the pay was being his sidekick? That's what it was. Babe, they believe, actually was, you know, gay or bi. But no, Loeb, uh, Dickie just did it for the, for, cause it, it helped him this way. How much That's what helped was so you fascinating do- about, like, like, <laughs> I guess, I guess it's hard to find a super genius sidekick. It's hard to find like good Maybe help. he got yeah, off. But what the like, fuck did he do? He's like, like, oh. He had like a 200 IQ guy following him around like a puppy dog. Maybe he got off on that. You know? Yeah, but what the, the what? How much help would he be when you're van- hey, fucking babe, come over here with your astrolabe and tell me what angle to throw this brick so that it crashes through that window at the bed? Like, what, what force should I apply to this in order <laughs> to break throw this down windshield? Some, yeah, throw down some quick ciphers so I can figure out how to grab that lady's boob. Like what? Hey, hey, before you steal this car, can you identify the bird shit that is surrounding it for me? <laughs> right, that you're off. Track on track. <laughs> <laughs> All right. In November of 1923, the boys took a trip to the University of Michigan. Dickie wanted to break into his old fraternity and steal, steal some stuff. Escape from their 12 hours of driving, six hours each way from Chicago, was about 80 bucks. A uh, bunch of watches from his brothers, a uh, few pen knives. I guess that was a popular thing for people to carry around. And a typewriter, a very important typewriter. Wait a minute. Mm-hmm. A pen knife is, is, a, is it one of those pens that looks like a that's no, very it's sharp? A little- or- it's a little jackknife. Like, it's yeah. just a little folding knife uh, that apparently, because in olden times, you never knew when you were going to need to cut open your food or stab someone I gotcha. in a okay. tiny way. 
It's okay. like, you know, but it's very slow. Like you got to get it and then you got to like, get, gotta get your fingers just right to open it and stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, hopefully you don't need it to defend yourself. <laughs> okay, got it. Yeah, because by the time you got it open, you'd already be dead. Yeah, you'd yeah. be dead. Okay. So after that take, Dickie was not happy. He needed more. He really wanted to do something riskier and more exciting. Babe wasn't happy either, either because all Dickie wanted to do was commit crimes. He never made time for love. Oh well, they God. had a six-hour drive. He could have given him some roadhead. <laughs> yeah. Jesus, Acadia. Well, I'm just well, saying. Know, back then, it was, it was a standard, right? Like his arm would have been there. Oh, and- yeah, that's true, too. Yeah, I don't know. Oh, when we were driving home once, my mother was driving and I was in the front seat and the guy in front of us was swerving all over the place. And she's like, what's wrong with that guy? And then all of a sudden this, this gal's head popped up from his lap and I was so fucking mortified. I was like 15 at the time. I wanted to just crawl out of the car and get in front of it so she could run me over. Oh, it was the worst. (laughs) We saw a guy, we saw a guy, he was, he was, it was like the, it was, it was the perfect, like late eighties moment. It was a guy in a convertible BMW oh, Jesus. on Northern State Parkway on Long Island driving. And you saw he did the arm thing, the whole arm thing and everything. Uh, and the head uh, went down. And I was, by, I had a uh, Suzuki Samurai and my friend started standing up and was screaming. The guy stuck his <laughs> arm up and gave us a thumbs up. Oh, my God. <laughs> Wow! Looking back, it's gross. But when I was nineteen, it was hilarious. Yeah, that's well, the best. I've never <laughs> encountered roadhead, so I guess I'm living in the dark ages. Yeah, what are you well, watching the road obviously. while you drive? Come I don't on, know. ten and two, ten and two. Pay attention. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, you're paying attention to ten and two. What Dick Babe wanted some six thirty. <laughs> <laughs> oh, poor babe. <laughs> so while Dickie hadn't been making any time for Babe, he promised him it would change. He told him that he cared about him and he had an idea of a for a crime that would satisfy Babe because he would be, be able to use that big brain of his. And would be able to show everyone, he would be able to show everyone how much smarter he was than they were. So it was on the drive home from that trip to Michigan that Dickie started talking about the perfect crime. Like thinking that if anyone had the intellect to do it, they did. So that's that's one of my first questions to you guys then. Uh, do you think there's any such thing as a perfect crime? And if you do, can you think of anybody who did it or came close or anything like that? Yeah, O.J. Simpson. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, you know, they got him eventually for something what? else. But yeah, no, uh, I would say that whoever robbed the and we did an episode on it way, way, way back in the day, the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum in Boston. Oh, yeah. They never caught those fuckers. And they stole some serious, serious art. That's and true. yeah, that's that's a big one. I would say also, I it, with a big caveat of if he lived, DB Cooper. Mm. But I don't know that he actually lived. I don't think he lived. I don't think he lived either. I think he I fell thought. directly into a. Big Bear's mouth. (laughs) (laughs) That's That's great. (laughs) That's why they never found anything, because he just basically swallowed him. (laughs) He just swallowed him whole. (laughs) The bear was yawning. (laughs) He was yawning, and an afternoon snack just fell right in there. Oh my gosh! Too bad Terrare wasn't around then. He could have just fell yeah. right in him. Oh, Terrare would have eaten him and the bear all at <laughs> once. And the bear. 
I mean, I think it, it's scary to think of how many uncaught serial killers there are out there right now. So I guess well, you could technically yeah. technically call those perfect crimes. You know what I mean? I mean, I guess I, what's perfect? Is it perfect if everybody knows there was a crime like the, the museum robbery, but they can't figure out who did it? Or is the perfect crime so perfect that nobody even knows it occurred? Like swapping out like a real painting for a forgery or something. Yeah, like that. yeah, yeah, like, yeah. Or or killing somebody that no one ever like. I mean, and this sucks, but if they never find the body, then technically it's never murder, right? right. You know, so that could be. I guess if somebody was going to think of it that way, then that would be the perfect crime. The per- the cr- yeah. the crime that people don't think was even th- that I'm even it, yeah that it happened. Right. Or else right. if I was the guys, how the fuck did the guys that robbed that museum not tell anybody? Yeah, that's the thing. Like I that's a that I that I have a lot of trouble figuring how people do that. Because the desire like like I had a friend tell me a tell me a secret yesterday <laughs> and tell me not to tell anybody and it it's been fucking killing me to not tell anybody. Well just like, tell I don't know us. how people I can't I can't. Because what about all of our listeners? They're all here. He's a good well, guy. He's not gonna. He's not gonna tell. He's a good guy. I'm not gonna. All right, tell. fine. He's he's a good guy. <laughs> he's a good guy. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Now that we now that we know that you can tease us with with incredible news that you're not going to share with us just yes, because I'm it's about sharing. somebody that we don't know and we're ghouls for wanting to know it. But whatever, go on. Yeah, that, yeah. That's just human nature. Yeah, all right. Hey there, it's Acadia here, and my partner, Hannah Selector, is going to tell us a little bit about the show we do together. Do you like horror movies? Stephen King? Ranting and raving? Join us for a meeting of the Castle Rock Historical Society. Tuesdays, wherever you listen to podcasts. Hey, Mel's. Hey, Jasmine. You want to tell these lovely people about our show? Well, I sure do. We're the hosts of the Damn Fine TV Podcast. A weekly show where two TV-loving ladies... That's us! ...bring you fresh insights and fun conversations about all things TV. The name of our show is a reference to Twin Peaks. Damn fine coffee. But we discuss a wide variety of shows. Everything from Chilling Adventures of Sabrina to American Horror Story. Westworld, Umbrella Academy, Lovecraft Country, and tons more. And now for the obligatory clip segment of the ad. What even are the tardigrade mysteries? I need a timeline. That's getting a trash flag. Who is in you? Confused? Better subscribe and listen to the show. We've got new episodes every Wednesday. Just search Damn Fine TV wherever you listen to podcasts and we'll be there. And come hang out with us on Instagram at Damn Fine TV. We share TV news, celebrities that make us thirsty, and have fun polls. And if you're watching TV, make sure it's Damn Fine TV. All right, so they so they they decided they were going to do the perfect crime, and they started planning. Now it took them seven months from the time of the University of Michigan robbery to when they decided to go for it. And they thought it long and hard about who their victim would be. They considered girls. They even considered their fathers. Damn. Yeah. Oh, so I guess we're going to say that the the cry the the perfect crime was not armed robbery. They were going right for the going right for the big M, right for the big one. Yeah. And Dickie decided on a kidnapping and murdering of a child. Damn. Dickie was fun, and being the good bitch that he was, Babe said, "Oh, yeah, that's a great idea." They <laughs> settled on Armand Deutsch as their victim. He was a uh, the great grandson of Julius Rosenwald, who was the CEO of Sears. So another tie into Sears. And the plan, you know, for for a couple of brainiacs coming up with something was really simple. They watched the boy for a while, learning his movements, determining the best place to strike. 
On the day of the murder, May 21st, 1924, Babe rented a car. They had car rentals back then? Yeah. Sure. Who knew? Oh, wow. For all four cars that were out there. That's pretty <laughs> interesting, though. All yeah. right. They obscured the license plate so nobody could report them. They typed up a ransom note using the typewriter they stole from the fraternity. Ooh. Then, mm. Dun, dun, dun. They also <laughs> bought a chisel. Now, they wrapped up one end of the chisel so they could use that side to bludgeon the boy and then the other end to stab him. Oh, jeez. That's double the fun, I guess, huh? (laughs) For fuck's sake. (laughs) So, being known around the neighborhood, they figured they could easily lure the boy into the car. Once they got doiked into the car, they would kill him with the chisel. They would then send a ransom note, dump the body, and collect the ransom from the Deutsches. I wonder if the axe man with his chisel <laughs> was mad that he didn't think of, like, oh, man, I could have been the, the chisel man of New Orleans. <laughs> chisel man. <laughs> he was this close to being the lamp man. Yeah, I just used, I just used it to knock the panels out of the doors. I'm a fool. <laughs> <laughs> so their plan was th- they were going to kill the kid right away and still collect the money. Yeah. I guess the 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 ransom and making the Deutsch family suffer more would give these fuckholes the rush that they wanted, <laughs> at least for Dickie. And it, going back to the chisel, why would they not just use a knife? Like, <laughs> why? They, it's like they really wanted to fuck this kid up. A goddamn chisel. Like, just picture a chisel hitting your front tooth. Oh, God. Well, they did wrap up one side so the chisel could pull double duty as a club. So you can't really do that with a knife, you know, because you can't grab the blade. Yeah, duh, should we? <laughs> what? Oh, you're a dick. <laughs> Whatever. Yeah, good only going, everything, Only everything did not work out as planned for our young wild E. Coyotes. <laughs> At about the time the a-holes b- planned to grab Deutsch, he was standing on the expected corner just like they planned, talking to another boy, Bobby Franks. Franks was coming from an after-school baseball game when he stopped to talk. It was then that Deutsch's chauffeur, another, you know, rich kid, arrived to pick him up. Deutsch forgot that he had a dentist appointment. 60 years after the murder, he was quoted as saying, When one measures the number of my dental appointments against the number of days in the school year... The odds against me were so formidable that no self-respecting Las Vegas gambler would have made a book on it. While not partial to dentists, since then I've always viewed the breed with an understandable tolerance. <laughs> well, because I live. Robert Stack. <laughs> What's that? <Yeah. laughs> Judy. <laughs> Judy Himes. <laughs> Stop. Well, well. <laughs> Franks only lived three blocks away, so he figured he'd just walk. That wouldn't prove to be the best decision for him. Oh, no. Because unfortunately for Franks, who happened to be Dickie's second cousin, yeah, Dickie and the babe were already primed and were going no matter what. Okay, wait a minute. So these, like, super geniuses planned the perfect crime for seven months... They work out all the details. Then on the day they plan to execute the intended victim isn't standing where they expected. So they just go and pick another kid instead of waiting for another day. Like I might not be the smartest or the brightest crayon in the box, but that sounds stupid. (laughs) Yeah, it it does indeed. (laughs) Shitty left. Let's rob a bank. (laughs) Exactly. Exactly. But don't forget the whole ubermensch thing too like these guys figured that they were so much fucking smarter than everybody else they could do they could just make the change and everything would be fine plus they had that whole concept of being above the law so you know what would ever happen to them anyway right they figured Uh that they the laws didn't apply to them Hmm. so they saw frank standing at the corner alone and decided to make their move on Dickie's cousin. 
<laughs> Babe was driving and Dickie was in the back seat. They pulled up next to little Bobby Franks and uh, Dickie called him over. Babe reached over and opened the, pa- opened the passenger door. Franks cautiously approached, but he was still kind of hanging back as he doesn't, he didn't know uh, the babe. When he recognized his cousin, he felt more comfortable and came closer and stood on the running board. Mm. Dickie introduced him to the babe and asked him if he wanted to take a ride around the block. You know, cars weren't so big, so it was a big deal, even for a rich kid. So Franks eventually agreed and got into the front seat and they started driving. Almost immediately, Loeb was on the kid, beating him over the head with the chisel. Jesus. For whatever reason, the kid just would not lose consciousness. Loeb hit him like four or five, six times. He Mm -mm. pulled him into the back seat and kept beating him. A gash opened up on the top of his head. Blood was fucking squirting everywhere because of the fucking head wound. God. Loeb had just fucking lost it, and I don't know if he was getting off on it or whatever, but he just could not stop himself and was making a fucking mess of it. You know, this was supposed to be clean and easy. Loeb shoved the rag into Frank's mouth and taped it. That finally got the kid to stop screaming and crying. Ugh. It's actually what killed him. He didn't die from the beating. He Hmm. was asphyxiated. That is fucking terrible. They taped his mouth shut. Jesus. And on the way to where they were planning to dump the body, Bobby Franks passed. The disposing stuff is pretty gross, so um, I'll let Acadia take that. Yeah, that's great. Let me be the one that... After tomorrow, you'll get whatever you whatever's coming, pal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But of course, this is this is why the axe man used the axe instead of the chisel because it's heavy. Like right. I could hit myself on the head with a chisel a bunch of times and not knock myself out. Right. Mm. Fucking genius is my ass. <laughs> if they had had a fucking, if they had had a sock full of fucking gravel, they would have done a better job. Not that I wanted them to do a better job, but fucking Bobby Frank's a human blockhead. They couldn't knock him out. I would have <laughs> felt better for the kid if he had been unconscious when it all happened. That's yeah. terrible. Yeah. Fuckers. All right. So they drove about 20 miles to Hammond, Indiana. They were feeling so confident, they even stopped for hot dogs and root beers on the way in their oh. gore smeared car. A little, a little post murder snack. Mm, yeah. Yes, I'm, I'm hungry. There's nothing, nothing, no, nothing says hot dog like the coppery smell of blood filling the car. <laughs> <laughs> so when they got to the dump site of some wetlands near Lake Michigan, they prepared the body for disposal. They poured hydrochloric acid on the boy's face, a distinguishing scar, and on his genitals. I understand the face and scar to make identifying him harder, but the genitals I don't get. It's not like you still wouldn't be able to tell he was a guy. Well, yeah, but see, it's because Bobby Franks was Jewish, and they did it to hide the fact that he'd been circumcised. Because circumcision was not a big thing for Gentile folk back then. So it would have been obvious that he was Jewish and would have narrowed down the victim pool there. So they were, they were gross enough to kill a kid with a chisel and by taping his mouth shut and pour acid all over his face, but they were too squeamish to cut off his dick. I don't. Yeah. I I was probably like, like, Ooh, I'm going to pour it. And they were like, like looking away while they did yeah, it. Like, <laughs> did I get it? Did I get it? Like he right. was wiener. Uh, so once they were done doing their best to make Bobby Franks an unrecognizable fucking mess, the poor kid, they took his mangled body and they dumped it in a culvert. So wait, what's a culvert? It's a it's a big pipe under a road or train tracks. You've probably seen them on the side of the road. Like people have them under their driveways if there's like a ditch where water goes. All right, so, okay, it's a big pipe. Now, so their super genius plan was to dump the body on the side of the road? Yeah, that was pretty much the plan. After dumping the body, they headed back to Chicago. Time out. Yeah. 
You said this took them seven months? <laughs> <laughs> it gets even better. Oh. All right. With how... Ugh. Yeah, that was the plan. After dumping the body, they headed back to Chicago. Once back in Chicago, they mailed off the ransom note to Jacob Franks, Bobby's dad. Leopold, they're not Babe and Dickie anymore because they've fucking killed somebody. So Leopold then called to Jacob's home claiming to be someone named Mr. Johnson. He told him that Bobby had been kidnapped and that instructions would follow. Unfortunately for our two murderers, Mr. Franks didn't keep it to himself and called the police. Mm. After the call, Leopold and Loeb spent some time getting rid of any evidence they could think of. They smashed and dumped the typewriter. They threw it over off a bridge. They ditched the chisel. They set their clothes on fire. They um, went back to Leopold's house and uh, were hosing out the car, because I guess you could do that back then, hose out your car. <laughs> It was metal inside. Yeah, it was metal and like real leather and stuff like that. You could do whatever you wanted. Yeah. <laughs> so while they were hosing all the blood out of the car, Leopold's chauffeur saw them. He even offered to help. <laughs> what? As he watched them hosing out the blood. They told him that it was just spilled red wine and that they could handle it. And apparently because he was an idiot... He believed them. Wow. Certainly, sir. Certainly, I would hate to get in the way of your, mm, your congealing wine red wine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> your clotted wine. <laughs> exactly. Oh. And once the car was clean, they headed out in Leopold's red car. They even picked up a couple of girls and tried to have sex with them. What the fuck? These guys were classy through and through. <laughs> now, when the women refused, they dumped them off and headed home. <laughs> what does that mean? They tried. Like, they, they, they tried. Like, running at them from odd angles. <laughs> like, they were like, hey, baby, want to do it in this funky red car? This hot red roadster? Oh my god. Babe was like, Wanna see me suck off Dickie? And then like <laughs> on the rumble seat. <laughs> Y'all are just so Y'all are out of control. That's Can you imagine though, those point. Those those women like had no idea. <laughs> they had no idea, but they must have known after the fact. So they would have been like, Oh yeah, yeah, we, we went on a date with Leopold and Loeb when they were yeah, that was that was actually a piece of of the story that I had to change because initially um one of the one of the sources I read said that they like picked up the girls on the way back. And I was like, how the fuck would they not notice all the blood everywhere? But yeah, right. I and realized, the chisel. <laughs> yeah, right. Then I realized later <laughs> then another source said how they came home changed and then went out. And that's how what's going. that? Going. Well, that's my sex chisel. Don't worry about that's it, baby. <laughs> <laughs> it's for love. Why is time. it bloody? Well, I just used it on low. Yeah. <laughs> Jesus. Okay. Well, back to the story here. Oh, thanks, Mel. The instructions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's <laughs> let's get back all focused. Uh, the instructions came the following morning when a messenger delivered the ransom note. Dear sir, proceed immediately to the back platform of the train. Watch the east side of the track. Have your package ready. Look for the first large red brick factory situated immediately adjoining the tracks on the east. On top of this factory is a large black water tower with the word champion written on it. Wait until you have completely passed the south end of the factory. Count five very rapidly and then immediately throw the package as far east as you can. Remember that this is your only chance to recover your son. Yours truly, George Johnson. Now, what a couple of assholes. I mean, these these instructions, plus these words are capitalized. Like, yeah, whatever. Sure. And also... 
unless i mean my kid would just be dead because as soon as they say east i'm like well i better go at sunup because that's the only way i'm gonna know which way is east <laughs> and how, what is, well, no, i'm not magellan <laughs> how is what is what is very rapidly counting to five one two three four five yeah exactly. like, come on <laughs> to five as fast as you can. <laughs> like on the way. Man. And imagine like Loeb is the one that wrote it, right? So right. Uh, Leopold, I'm sorry. Leopold's the one who wrote it. And he's this little, like nothing of a guy. And you can only imagine what his throwing form must have been like. <laughs> oh, Him throwing to the east is like, eh. He just wanted to include some counting <laughs> I just love numbers and birds. <laughs> <laughs> so at this point, they got the note out. According to Leopold and Loeb, everything was going exactly according to plan. The plan for the day was to call Jacob Franks again, tell him when he should head out for the train. Now, unfortunately for our two little douche weasels, other shit was happening of which they were not aware. Now, on the morning of May 22nd, not even a day since this super genius plan to murder and kidnap and murder Bobby Franks was executed, but not even a day later, someone walking by noticed his body. Oh, Christ. And called the police. So the next morning, somebody's already finding the body. In an oddly smart move for police in one of our stories, the cops immediately thought of Bobby Franks. And they called the family to ID the body. Now, Bobby's father didn't want to believe that it could be him, so he sent the boy's uncle. Um... He, the dad, meaning the dad, then ran out to get the money. He was still going to take care of it. That's sad. He was still going to pay it, yeah, because he didn't know anything. But upon returning from getting the cash, he received a call from the uncle. He'd seen the body, and it was Bobby's. So their acid thing didn't even work? No. So as planned, Leopold called the Franks again as, as, you know, George Johnson given instructions like, hey, you got to leave for the train now. Uh, but too bad for, for them. He called after the call from the uncle. Mm. Um, and the dad fucking lost it. And he let them know that the boy was dead. So the jig was up. You know, we, we talked a little bit earlier about the idea of a perfect crime even being a thing. Now, I think let's close out this part of the of the episode with what are your thoughts on this attempt? And there is shit that you guys don't even know about yet on this attempt at perfection. This their seven month plan? Yes. Yeah. Wow. How do you rate their seven month plan? Two thumbs down. <laughs> yeah. Zero stars. It's it's so poorly executed. I uh, mean like I said, there'll be there'll be stuff that comes in that how they get, you know, obviously this this I said this is a trial of the century thing, so obviously they get caught. So that's not really a spoiler, but like the stuff that they did that 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 lead to them getting caught is just so fucked up which is which is one of the other reasons I love I love the story is just you know you have these guys that are that think they're so fucking above everybody like in every way and they're fucking hammerheads yeah <laughs> they're fucking idiots well you know, it's like idle rich people that just don't know like, I don't know what I should do. Maybe I'll go. It's like you see in movies. Like, oh, I'll go hunt some people or some shit like that. It's just like. I don't so know. It, to me, to this point. It, Loeb just seems like he was a kind of a sociopath who just happened to be rich. 
I think that's fair. Because he was the one that was fucking with everything and lying. And and Leopold, for his part, I mean, I don't care how rich you are. It can't have been easy to be gay in 1924. Yeah. No. You know? And we'll uh, get into that, too. So he had his own set of problems. And hero worshiping this dude and everything like that none of that excuses any of it because the fact of the fucking matter is is that everything they did was wrong and none of it worked as far as i can tell up to this point like now but the one thing i will say is that you gave props to the cop um and this would have been indiana cops yes so essentially being a if well a rich white boy is missing we've we've got to call this in immediately <laughs> right it's an out of state cop it's not even a cop in the right. same state and they were able to get word to chicago why well, everybody knows about the frank boy he's rich exactly ay 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 yeah this was like jean bonnet oh, for fuck's sake we'll do that case sometime that can be a Mel's. No. That's a fun one. <laughs> right. Mel. No. Oh, no. No. That's, oh, that is so heartbreaking. Ugh. Well, they all are. They're all heartbreaking. This no, poor Bobby Frank's kid, this poor little fuck, he, he sees his fucking cousin. His, his damn know. cousin. His family. Yeah. His, his own fucking family, and he kills him. Yeah, and he's up. the one, you know, at this point that it looks like did it. And we'll, we'll, you know, we'll learn more later, but. And we got a whole nother, whole nother episode. There is so much more shit to do on this. Wow. Um, I have a lot to fit in the few pages I have left. And we'll have to do a recap too. Yeah, we'll have to, well, we'll do a, in the next episode, we'll do a recap of this. We'll. And then we'll get into the investigation and the trial, which the the trial was was just tremendous. Although technically it wasn't a, even a trial, but um, uh, but we'll get into all that. It's it's really fascinating, and it and it's uh, and you know what people were thinking in the public and stuff like that in the at the time that this was going on is, is all super fascinating, and uh. I can't, yeah, I can't wait for to share it all with y'all next week. I think it's going to be. I think it'll be a good ending to this. Well, that's a kick-ass job, Chewy. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you. It only took months to get done. Huh? Yeah, I know it took. It, it took longer for you to write the script than it did for them to plan the crime. <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> uh, so hey, there it is. Yeah. So if you would like to contact any of us, you can reach me on twitter and instagram and i'm trying to start getting active in them even doing fun stuff not just crazy stuff and that is at chewy time uh both insta and twitter to get acadia on twitter it's at acadia and on insta it's at acadia einstein uh mel's on twitter is at mel's bells 84 and at superficial mel's on insta and you can also reach the show at Strangeful Pod on Twitter. I should really take a week and just tweet as as the show. Yeah, yeah, why not? I should. Instead of harassing no. us to do shit. It- <laughs> <laughs> so we're gonna have a meeting after this. Oh no! Should we do a principal's office? Should we do a principal's office? <laughs> oh no! Well, if you'd like to hear more of these shenanigans, try <laughs> to uh, rate and review us. Um, word of mouth is good too. Tell a friend about us. That's right. And uh, shout out to um, Dolly, who's our newest uh, patron. And thank you very much for your support. Yay, Dolly. If you, Yay, Dolly. If, if you want to be like Dolly, you can go to patreon.com slash strangeful. And we have fun levels and uh, extra content and chill time and all sorts of neat stuff that 
that you can't get anywhere else. Yeah, and we're getting a lot better at putting shit out too. That's right. Just so you all know, we're we're get, we're putting out a lot of extra content for y'all. Damn straight. Yeah, and while you're at it, count your blessings. And while you're at it, also uh, keep on flapping. <laughs> <laughs> God damn it. Bye-bye.